Uh, we have USIP staff on either side of the auditorium. I know a number of questions have already been collected. I have some here in the front. Let me begin, though, with one while we're providing you some time to make sure that you are able to get your cards to our colleagues. Follows, that follows on Osama's observations about the, the role of the international community and what the international community might do to support both the SNC and the Syrian uprising. And the question is, what has the international community asked of the SNC? So far, the formation of the SNC has been greeted with some statements of support. It has also been greeted by uh, expressions of caution about the willingness of Western governments to extend formal recognition to the SNC. We imagine that those exchanges also include guidance or feedback from your interlocutors in Washington, London, Paris, Brussels, Berlin, uh, other capitals, about what the international community expects from the SNC in turn. It would be helpful to hear you say something about that and to say something about the steps you are taking to respond to the guidance you're receiving from Western governments. And I open that up. Osama, you may wish to address this. Najib, Dima, Murhaf. I mean, of course, we don't expect the um, formal recognition straight away. It has to take some time. Um, uh, many um, key actors uh, in Europe, also including the United States, they need to make sure that it is inclusive enough, it is functioning, it is well managed, it can make a um, decision in a certain way that uh, uh, brings results. Uh, we've all seen the demonstrations in more than 120 cities and villages and towns. They even had celebrations when they announced the Syrian National Council with fireworks. I don't know where they brought the fireworks from, but they had fireworks. Um, they grassroots, they even uh, uh, um, created a, a kind of national anthem for the National Council. And now there is a, if you see all the videos and you follow the YouTube, every single video that coming out of Syria, they have a, a poster first with the SNC logo, then the location of the demonstration and an explanation. So the support, the wide, big, huge support inside the country is there. Uh, we understand that um, that kind of recognition is a huge step. Some countries, and I, you know, some regional countries here, um, you know, I've been told that this, if they recognize the Syrian National Council, it will be a, a, a declaration of war against the Assad regime, and it's, it's very serious. So, but they are moving in that direction. Turkey, for instance, they not only welcome the Syrian National Council, but also agree to open a, a formal office. If you, you've seen the rec formal recognition uh, from Libya, the N uh, NTC, and uh, they are now within the coming 24 to 48 hours, we are going to, they are going to hand up us the embassy there, because they um, asked the embassy staff to leave and we'll be taken over. Uh, we hope that the rest of the countries follow suit. Many of the even high-level uh, meetings with key leaders in the region have taken place, uh, yet not publicly yet. Uh, many of the uh, their concerns, obviously, it's, it's a regional stability. It is uh, uh, the future of the missiles. It's, it's the chemical weapons program. All these serious questions that we need to really uh, discuss and talk and make decisions on. So. It is going to take some time, but yet we need to have that kind of positive progress that we can uh, see and, and build on. Thank you. Others on this? Um, to build on what Osama said, the international community would like to see from the SNC a vision for the future, a political program. What happens the day after? Who is going to turn on the lights after the Assad regime has collapsed? who is going to control traffic, and so on. And these are very legitimate demands, because Syria should not be made to uh, 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 go down in a spiral of chaos. And so the international community legitimately wants to see these things happen. Unfortunately, Mr. Riyad Saif, who was going to give us uh, his vision for the future, uh, representing the SNC, uh, is unable to be 
uh, with us today. The SNC, again, is a work in progress. It, is a, uh, it has a history now of not over a week. And as we speak, the leadership of the SNC is putting together a political program to show to the international community, to show not only the seriousness, uh, not only the, um, the political will, but also to show the international community that Syrians know the need to have such a political program. Just one word on that. Mm -hmm. um, adding to what my colleague said, I think the international community is very much concerned about uh, the foreign policy orientation of the SNC, the alternative, what's their vision. And I think that um, um, this is not really a difficult one to articulate because Syrians um, have not necessarily been uh, consulted in, in um, you know, how the foreign policy of the regime um, was conducted over the last uh, you know, few decades. So I think um, as a result of that, Syrians um, are focusing on, are going to focus on their domestic, basically, uh, agenda um, on questions of development, on question of building a viable political system. So they do believe in order to do that, they, um, they, have, to have, uh, they have to be a force of stability in the region. Um, and I think of all of the maybe foreign policies of, of, of the, uh, the current regime, uh, the main maybe uh, one that's not, you know, kind of popular among uh, Syrian oppositions is its relations with Iran. Uh, it's kind of accepted to be a junior partner in that project. Um, it's, uh, I think, uh, everybody within the Syrian opposition believes in a vision of maybe uh, reaching peace with Israel based on the Arab initiative. Um, and basically on uh, really being a force, again, of, of uh, regional stability. So I think that's, that's something, um, again, is going to be part of that vision. Najib, let me push you on, on the foreign policy question a bit, recognizing that, that the, the imperative of the SNC in an initial post-Assad period will necessarily be on on constructing a domestic political order. We had three questions from the audience that asked about different aspects of the foreign policy uh, of a post-Assad Syria as seen by the SNC. One uh, concerned Iran. You've already spoken to that a bit. I'll ask the question in case it introduces some different dimensions. The first came to us via Twitter. If the Assad regime does fall, how do you see Syria's relationship with Hezbollah changing? And how would, the, how would the fall affect the Lebanese government? Second, which was addressed directly to Osama Munajid and Amur Havjoujati, Le Figaro reported Iranian delegates met with Syrian opposition in Europe. Can you confirm this? What is the likelihood of SNC dealing with Iran post-Assad? Third, what is the SNC's view of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon? And does the SNC have any relations with any grouping, political or otherwise, in Lebanon? So you may not be able to escape okay. <laughs> interest in your foreign policy orientation as much as you might like to. Um. I'll focus on Lebanon. Maybe my colleagues could take the question of Iran. Thanks. Uh, Taking the easy one. <laughs> <laughs> Taking the easy one. Uh, in 2006, uh, Syrian uh, intellectuals, activists, uh, signed with their Lebanese counterpart a short document called the Damascus Beirut Declaration. And it really sets very basic principles uh, as to the uh, future relationship between the two countries. It's based on a um, very simple uh, idea of respecting the independence of Lebanon. We Syrians believe that we suffered um, the mismanagement of the relationship between the regime and the Lebanese. Uh, basically parties, groups, uh, throughout the process of uh, uh, Syrian military presence in Lebanon that's, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, led to many Lebanese to, to uh, look unfavorably towards Syrians. So we believe that this relationship should be based on, again, respecting the independence and sovereignty of Lebanon, 
on close uh, but equal um, working relationship between the two countries. On the question of Hezbollah, and I think, again, this is a, you know, a view we believe that uh, the best way for to solve the question of Hezbollah is uh, to move toward a disarmament of this uh, movement and the integration of this movement into the political process. Um, and so uh, the, to add to the question of the tribunal, um, we believe that it should, in fact, uh, be continued. Um, we were basically uh, supportive of its formation, and we uh, accept its outcomes. Um, and so I think those are very basic principles upon which we, we see the relationship, future relationship with Lebanon. Uh, we, throughout you know, the, the last couple of years, felt that uh, um, you know, we share uh, maybe uh, more with the so-called 14th um, March uh, forces in Lebanon, um, and, and um, we kind of understand um, their willingness to uh, assert their uh, Lebanon's independence and, and sovereignty. So those are the basic principles. So we do have some, in fact, clear ideas as to how to have that relationship. Uh, Morhaf, Iran. <laughs> I do not want to preempt the uh, Syrian National Council uh, leadership uh, into putting them in a particular position. So I'm going to uh, hypothesize, I'm going to uh, uh, speculate and say that the strategic alliance between Syria and Iran will be no longer. This is not to say that Syria would cut off its relationship altogether with Iran. It will probably maintain a diplomatic relationship that is not superior to other relations with other states. But I, I do not foresee that there would be a continued strategic alliance with Iran, as is the case today. And uh, Hezbollah, I think, would be function of that. And this dovetails nicely with uh, what uh, uh, Najib is saying with regard to, uh, uh, with regard to Hezbollah. Um, just to answer the question whether the, any members of the SNC met with the Iranians in Europe, it was not an SNC member that was that took place um, with uh, an individual with the opposition. It is not an SNC member. Uh, there is still no um, um, you know, position of the SNC on how to handle the Iranian um, outreach yet or any discussion with the Iranians. That's, and it's not on top of our agenda, to be honest. Uh, there are far more uh, pressing issues and important issues to deal with first. Um, there are obviously signals from the Iranians we've heard in the past uh, few weeks uh, coming from the Security, uh, National Security Council uh, that uh, Assad should meet the demands of the people, trying to signal out these. We've seen uh, even Hezbollah uh, leadership um, announcing such um, also positions from Lebanon, signaling that they try to distance themselves somehow. They all see the collapse of the regime. Everyone sees the collapse of the regime happening as inevitable. Uh, apart from the Assad, and um, I think they're yeah, calculating their, their steps accordingly. Uh, post, again, post uh, Assad Syria, not a single party in Syria will have in his manifesto or in its manifesto a, a, anything to do with uh, having close relationship with Iran, including the far right or whoever is going to be running on the far right in Syria, because um, everyone in the streets are chanting against Iran and Hezbollah and they will straight away lose vote. So that's, that's my, uh, my take on it. Thank you. Dima, you may, may I please, just say uh, one sentence I mean, here uh, to corroborate what Osama is saying. One of the chants on the street has been, La Hezbollah, la Iran, nahna man hibbak Erdogan. <laughs> Neither Hezbollah nor Iran, we love you, O Erdogan. So that tells you something. Dima, you, you discussed the diversity of the SNC and its efforts to reassure Syrians uh, inside of Syria about its commitment to diversity. We had a couple of questions pushing uh, on that issue. Um, one, and, and the author of this note card is to be applauded. There are seven <laughs> questions on this note card. I, I, um, I will do my best, I, I assure you, to, to weave them into the conversation. One is, how can the international community have confidence that the SNC genuinely determined, is genuinely determined to share power with minorities to include them fully in the distribution of power in a new Syria? How can, have Syrian, how can Syrians have this 
confidence. And in a related question, it's an interesting one, and, and we haven't addressed it thus far this morning, but it does have some connections to this previous concern. Which groups remain loyal to the Assad regime? And what, if anything, can be done to convince them to change their minds, withdraw their support, and I will add, perhaps even potentially participate in bringing about a change of regime. So Dima, perhaps you would be willing to take the first stab at that, uh, and then we can hear from others with something to add. Sure, sure. Um, as for the, uh, the first question about the international community, how to assure that uh, all groups will be represented, um, I think so far what we've done in the SNC itself, if you, uh, as I had mentioned, if you look at the makeup of the SNC, we feel confident right now that uh, the majority of the groups in Syria, based on sectarian or religious or ethnic background, um, are well represent represented in the SNC. And since this is um, a group that we want the recognition as le the legitimate representatives of the Syrian people, um, you know, having representation from all ethnic groups and sects, um, I think is one step towards that assurance that everybody in Syria will be, will be participating in, in the process, in the political process um, and the rebuilding process in the post-Assad era. Um, for example, even within our, um, w right now that we have three levels in the SNC, we have the General Assembly, which is the 230 members. We have the uh, Executive Committee, which is 29 members. And then we have the Presidential Group, which is seven members. And even within that, those seven, um, we have at least one, we have one seat for um, Assyrians, for example. Um, that's a very small group in, in Syria. For those who don't know, it's, uh, it's an, an ethnic group. Um, they're all Christian. So one out of the seven in the, in the presidential committee um, represent, you know, is, is dedicated for that. So I think we're, we're doing all we can to, to give these assurances that everybody will be represented. Um, and there's no fear of um, overlooking any particular group within Syria. And, and this question about which groups continue to support the regime? First, I'd like to add something to what Dima said. I think one of the main guarantees of uh, um, you know, future representation of all Syrians, particularly minorities, is the kind of political system uh, we uh, set, we, we kind of uh, uh, chart, and um, um, I think here we are uh, grateful to the Assad regime that uh, uh, most Syrians have reached the conclusion that we don't want to have any type of minority rule, um, whether that minority comes from um, different ethnic religious backgrounds or from the majority. I mean, any kind of uh, uh, group that's trying to monopolize power is going to be basically uh, opposed by the consensus, the emerging consensus of Syrians who um, had enough of that kind of political uh, structure. So I would say the, the, the you know, uh, uh, charting a new political system which is, um, uh, you know, democratic in nature that uh, benefits from the experiences of other countries. Now, with Syria, I think the question of minorities sometimes uh, is really not clear. Um, Syria is not uh, Iraq, neither Lebanon. I mean, we're not talking about, uh, you know, a very, very divided country. I mean, yes, the, the peculiarity of Syria was that um, uh, the members of the particularly Alawite minority um, uh, had disproportionate power in the security uh, and, and army. Um, and um, so uh, I think we, we do have a clear majority in Syria, but uh, whenever we talk about democracy being de defined as majority rule, we always in Syria are more sensitive to the other side, which is with respect to the rights of minorities. And um, before all of that, I think um, a state that is based on equal citizenship is going uh, is something that's been embraced by everyone um, uh, in in Syria. Um, the groups that are still kind of considered to be supportive of the Syrian regime, I would say um, I, I, they're more silent uh, than supportive.
supportive, and, and I, I'm, I'm one of those who believe that silence is positive silence. I think there are some fear among the Alawites, and uh, understandably so, and we have to work and reach out to them and, and in fact, um, uh, make sure that they are part of not only the future of Syria, but of the leadership of the, the SNC and, and the uh, movement that's trying to bring about democratic, democratic, uh, democratic change in Syria. Um, uh, as far as the um, second, you know, kind of community that's considered somewhat um, uh, waiting to see, um, and, and uh, again, maybe there is some fear among members of this community, is the Christian community in Syria. And um, I think um, uh, the, we have to uh, reach out, we have to uh, send all kinds of assurances, and, and uh, not only in words, but, but in, in, in practice, and um, by again inviting them to be uh, part of this leadership. I, I want, do want to say that, by the way, I mean, these uh, activists in these two communities have been at the forefront of this revolution. Uh, the first uh, fallen heroes of this revolution in the coastal area actually came from the Christian and the Alawite community. And I, I you know, very much value um, the, the, how brave are the activists who come from these communities, especially the Alawite community, because they're under dual pressure, in fact. And, and so um, we are very, again, cognizant of, of uh, the, the, some of the fear that exists, uh, but we are working um, extremely hard to uh, assure everyone. And, and what we want uh, by the end is uh, Syria for all. Yes, please. In addition to the minorities that Najib uh, has talked about, there is, of course, the uh, uh, army and intelligence apparatus. And here it is the senior ranks that are uh, supportive of Bashar al-Assad. Uh, the bodies of these two, uh, not necessarily, they will go where the wind blows. But again, it's the senior leadership uh, in the armed forces and the intelligence. It is also the senior leadership in the Ba'ath Party. It's not on ideological grounds, because the Ba'ath Party has become an empty ideological shell, uh, but it is out of opportunism and out of uh, uh, the necessity to continue in the corrupt ways uh, of uh, the Ba'ath leadership in cahoots with the Assad regime. Um, uh, the ministerial bureaucracy. And here you have a large apparatus of bureaucrats who, again, after 48 years, uh, uh, after 48 years of this bureaucracy, uh, now has all sorts of networks to receive bribes from and so on. And so they have a vested interest in the perpetuation of the status quo. And finally, and we hear a lot of talk about the business elite. Let me tell you that the business elite is no more than 10 to 15 people. <laughs> this is the business elite and uh, uh, those who are uh, uh, in partnership, in business partnerships uh, with the Assad family. Otherwise, uh, the merchant class, of course, has been, I don't want to say supportive, but has been uh, silent for a long time because of the perception that the Assad regime provided stability. And stability is good for capitalism. Stability is good for making profits and so on. Well, now Assad has become a source of instability. And so uh, it is not going to be too long before the business community turns against Bashar al-Assad, except those 10 uh, to 15 in this top uh, uh, of the business elite. I just want to elaborate on the business yeah. community. There are, as I said, more than 45,000 detainees. When there's someone detained, it's he's, he's or she is the wage earner of that family. The whole family needs support, needs um, uh, financial support for education needs, um, medical and life, exp uh, you know, living expenses. Who is paying for all these uh, families? And it's not only the immediate family that everyone have, you know, three, four children, but it's his brothers also and his family, his uh, sisters and the rest bigger, wider family. All of that is financed by the business people in Damascus. With the one phone call from someone, 10 million Syrian pounds is distributed in town X or in town Y. Or that amount of money is sent to someone to get medical supplies from Lebanon or from X or Y. We are talking big money and all being financed by the Damascene business elite we're talking about. So it, it, they are not uh, uh, obviously in, in, the, in the camp of the Assads. But do not expect these people and their workers and supporters or families to go and demonstrate. It's, not, it's just not their nature. The middle class or upper middle class, they will not go and demonstrate. I mean, even if the Assad regime collapses. In Tahrir Square in Cairo, 
majority of them, more than 80%, we're not from Cairo. So this is something that we, we, we need to address, that when is Aleppo or Damascus going to go in masses and millions? You will never see this. Perhaps people coming from around Damascus, and the people of Damascus are supporting, helping with networking, with finance, with other things, but they're not going to go and chant. It's just their nature. This question of the role of the business community is really an important one. And, and it is the case, Murhaf, that the peak business elite is very small. But the business community of Syria extends well beyond this. Uh, Osama's comment suggested it that one of the consequences of the last six or seven years of, of, um, of economic uh, uh, growth in Syria prior to the uprising has been to spread uh, the wealth, has been to increase opportunities for new business interests to prosper. And a number of, of questions uh, were presented concerning the business community. They've been touched on in part. I, I want to pose them because I think they give us an opportunity to look beyond those peak business elites and think about where the broader middle class, traders, uh, industrialists, small scale business actors uh, fall in, in, in this process. First question, has the SNC reached out to business interests in Damascus, but also in Aleppo, mm -hmm. who've benefited from the regime and have um, hung back from supporting regime change? Second, what can the Syrian business community do to topple the regime? If, uh, Osama, as you indicate, they are reluctant to take a more public position in support of change, what can they do to help topple the regime? There's a question about whether the American private sector can play a role in advancing the aims of the Syrian uprising. And then, finally, a question about the impact of sanctions. Hmm. and whether we can anticipate that as sanctions continue to bite, the sympathies or political orientation of the business community might change and uh, make it less difficult for them to align themselves more explicitly with, with the opposition. So again, I, I turn that to whom over on the panel would like to step in first. Just can I address the Aleppo nice. effect? Yes, uh, there has been a lot of discussion within uh, Syrian activists about uh, the lack of strong, um, maybe, support for the revolution in Aleppo, the city of Aleppo, the second largest city in, in the country. Um, and um, I think there are maybe a couple of factors that must be taken into account. I think the business community of Aleppo is actually is one of them. Um, Aleppo has benefited um, over the last few years of this, whatever you want to call economic, I don't know, uh, it's hard, hard to come up with terms that describe, uh, it's not really economic development, it's economic growth, it's, uh, the, the fruits of which are uh, basically uh, distributed at a small um, circle, but definitely one of them was the business community of Aleppo, who felt uh, a stake in, in the continuation of, of the system, and this is a fact, I mean, that we have to, to address. Um, the, but the second factor, which explained maybe uh, uh, the lack of uh, support uh, of the, for the revolution in, in Aleppo, I think has to do with the a couple of things. One has to do with the memory of the 80s. Aleppo was one of the main cities that was really uh, uh, hit hard with the repression back then. It was Aleppo and, and Hama. People, you know, remember Hama, but don't think of Aleppo. So uh, there is that, and, and there's heavy uh, security presence in, in, in Aleppo um, that uh, may be very close to Damascus, and that, again, explains uh, part of it. The, the business community of actually of Aleppo, um, we have several credible reports uh, uh, recruited a group of uh, thugs. Uh, those, the word for those in Syria are shabiha, um, and and um, they've been uh, trying to go after activists and, and harass them. And, and uh, um, uh, there, the number of those activists who've been arrested in Aleppo is, is actually a large number. Um, and those who maybe might play the role in leading uh, the activities. Uh, the lastly, I think with Aleppo, the official religious community. And here again, we were 
we're talking about maybe minorities not being very supportive of the revolution. We're talking about the Sunni class, uh, including the Mufti of Syria, who comes, uh, this is the highest religious authority in Syria, who comes from Aleppo. And um, uh, I don't know if you um, uh, followed two important uh, things related to the Mufti. One. Uh, his son was assassinated, um, sadly, and, and it could have been by the thugs, actually. It's part of the regime's attempts to, again, create this notion of the armed gangs. And, and so, um, and then second, uh, you know, he came out yesterday or the day before and threatened those countries that uh, try to take action, military action against Syria, that they are going to face uh, suicide bombers of the magnitude they haven't seen uh, yet. So uh, you have those religious actually voices in the city of Aleppo uh, playing um, to the advantage of the regime. They are part of that, that uh, coalition that's really benefited from the Bashar's rule. So I think, um, but, but I think I, I agree with Usama and Morhaf that in, in Damascus at least we see growing number of the small business, small scale business, uh, you know, owners and, and uh, businessmen, uh, I think are kind of joining the revolution and, and are looking for a change of the regime. Um, so I think we do again need to assure this community in Aleppo and elsewhere that uh, in fact they could grow under a, a democratic Syria, uh, they, there won't be, uh, there would be more equal opportunity, they would have chance to, um, you know, prosper uh, as opposed to, you know, have to share every, everything with the makhlouf or one of their cronies. Just want to uh, give one small anecdote, give an example of how the, the thinking of these top 10 or 15 big, large um, names of business in Syria now started to think. Uh, Mr. Yatsef was invited to uh, one of the receptions at one of the embassies in Damascus, and there was these um, top ten names were present. I'm sorry, who, who was invited? Riyadsef. Mr. Riyadsef was invited to a reception at one of the embassies, and these top ten were there. So he was talking to diplomats and ambassadors when the big names started to squeeze in and try to talk and appear and, and, and be seen with you know, talking to Riyadh Saif. And he started to ask him a question, oh, Mr. Saif, do you think this or do you think that? At the time where, a few years ago, where they distancing themselves. I mean, Riyadh Saif, he's part of that club. He's a, a, a you know, a, a millionaire businessman. I was uh, at, one, at one time before they throw him in jail. And he was telling me how they, the whole mood is completely different now. They're trying to approach and talk and be seen close because they realize now how things are now changing. And frankly, we don't think that there's a huge impact to these 10 or 15 big um, names. Yes, they have big, huge companies, but the vast majority of the workers or the working class is uh, employed by SMEs in the country, as small and medium enterprises or companies. Uh, and those are certainly in support, And uh, as I uh, explained. What, what they can do, uh, mainly financial support, that's what we need. And, uh, and uh, also they have connections worldwide because of their trade uh, that they do. Also we need them to utilize these kind of connections. There's also we need to distinguish between the uh, business types in Damascus and in Aleppo. Aleppo is more in industrialist. Most of the factories and, uh, and machinery are in Aleppo, while in Damascus more finance and services and trade. So those in Aleppo, they fear for like, the capital invested in these um, um, also uh, uh, businesses. Unfortunately, most of the um, corrupt, most corrupt uh, people in the business side in Aleppo, they deal with money laundering and drugs. They do all the nasty business for the regime through Turkey and channeling the drugs from Lebanon to Turkey to Europe. And they have been given free hand for everyone to create their own militia. Every business now, they have their own militia. They even carry badges with different names uh, for different businesses. Uh, they're being financed and paid by these. So uh, it's, it's very tough and intense in Aleppo, but uh, in Damascus, it's moving much more in a, in a, in a better way. And uh, we expect even the big names to be supportive, and especially now that Mr. Saif is uh, announced as a, a leading member of the SNC inside. Um, there are several meetings scheduled with these big names. Yeah, thank you. With regard to the U.S. private sector, how can it help? Well, other than your prayers, um, we need for you to cancel your agreements with those very well-connected agents of yours. 
this is a phenomenon, of course, that is not true only of the United States private sector, but anywhere in the world, uh, is that large companies usually like to have well-connected agents so that they could uh, sell more. Well, uh, well-connected in Syria means part and uh, parcel of the Assad family and its uh, cronies. And so it's a very good thing, it's a blessing that Rami Makhlouf, the uh, most corrupt par excellence in Syria, has been the uh, subject of targeted sanctions. Uh, but there are mini-me Rami Makhloufs in Syria uh, who represent U.S. corporations. And uh, uh, so it would be a very good thing for these U.S. corporations to rethink the kind of agents that they need. Uh, one brief... Uh, uh, point, uh, Steve, about the business elite. There has been some trickle down uh, uh, as a result of the uh, uh, openness uh, in the economy by Bashar al-Assad in the past 11 years, but it has not trickled down nearly enough, obviously. Uh, and there is an alienation by the nouvelle bourgeoisie that had been created under Hafez al-Assad that was allied to the regime that provided legitimacy uh, to the barons of the regime and uh, got privileges from these barons in exchange. Uh, these, this nouvelle bourgeoisie that, was, that benefited from the largesse of the state has been alienated by a uh, newer nouvelle bourgeoisie, which is the Rami Makhlouf phenomena and so on of the Bashar al-Assad uh, regime, who has gotten uh, the, the biggest uh, pieces of the pie. Thank you. Najib got us launched this morning by situating the Arab uprising within the broader context of the Arab Spring. One of the most significant developments of the Arab Spring has been to vastly expand space for the political mobilization and political participation of women. At the same time, we've often seen that as transitions proceed, uh, sometimes to successful outcomes, the space for women's participation tends to narrow somewhat, and opportunities to remain engaged in shaping post-transition uh, political orders uh, tend to diminish for women. And a question that we've received concerns whether the SNC has given any thought to the question of how to sustain opportunities and frameworks for the participation, active participation of women, both in the uprising, but also on the day after and beyond, once the challenges of building a new post-Assad political order move to the front of the agenda. Well, um I think women's participation in this revolution um, has been critical, um, even though it has not been really uh, uh, presented uh, to the extent that it should be. Um, at the level of activists on the ground in Syria, I think one of the two symbols of, of this beginning of this revolution uh, are two women, Suhair Latassi and Razan Zaytouni. Uh, both of them are very well connected to the grassroots young revolutionaries who are actually very uh, supportive uh, of, of uh, the leadership status of, of uh, women. Um, there are a lot of, again, other women who are less well known um, in, in the various provinces. But these are two high-profile names I, I would like always to, to mention, and we're very proud of them. Um, but. Um, uh, we've seen, I mean, at the beginning of the um, demonstrations in Syria, yes, we've seen mostly men uh, taking uh, into the street. Um, it's, it's um, you know, kind of really due to the fact that uh, these men are met with uh, uh, life ammunitions and, and they're shot at and, and killed and, and all that. But we've seen several women demonstrations in, in well, many, many towns and, and um, cities. Um, again, women have been uh, providing a lot of support uh, for uh, the revolution, both uh, inside the country and outside. Um, what uh, SNC has done um, is, is really like, uh, as I said, we were very, um, uh, we believe that women should be represented at all levels, all three layers of uh, the structure of SNC. Um, as we were discussing the expansion of SNC, uh, we um, agreed on one recommendation that all a newly joined group should have um, women representation 
Um, this is something uh, I could see, it was good to see that there was a consensus over that, that question. Um, and um, uh, the guarantee for the future is really a hard one, Steve. And I, I agree with you that women were more active in the Egyptian Tunisian revolution, and now they're complaining that uh, they've been marginalized. I think this is a challenge. This is a continued challenge. Um, building a democracy, I think, is, is something that's uh, not going to end with the uh, overthrowing of a regime. I think this is the first step. I think. Uh, what could happen during the transition um, is uh, many things could go wrong. But w one of the, the, the points that we should continue to, to, to make is that um, uh, we should promote women participation, as I said, at all levels, recognize their roles, and uh, um, give them the opportunity to take a leadership position. Uh, that's, I think, uh, something at least we're doing so far. Um, and uh, Dima mentioned at least some percentages and figures we, we were able to, to do. Uh, w again, there, there's something in the, in the Arab culture that's uh, very significant. Um, when, as we were talking about women's participation at the NC, SNC, uh, we were very clear that we, don't, we didn't want talking women. And we wanted women who really are highly qualified of the same caliber that you know we wanted to to be uh, at the leadership. And I'm very uh, glad that we have a very prominent um, activist uh, within SNC uh, in the interim period of the formation of the S SNC. Our spokesperson was Dr. Basma Qadamani, uh, who is a political scientist, very active, played a major role in the formation of SNC. I just want to add a little bit to that. Obviously, being a woman, um, you know, it's uh, it's an issue that always comes up, a question that, that's always being asked. And I think one of the important things for women who are involved in this process, who are in the SNC, myself included, is to work on encouraging other women. Um, I think it's part of... Uh, we're not going to lie. It's part of our culture. Um, I don't think it's the men necessarily... Um, not giving women opportunities because sometimes the women withdraw themselves from certain opportunities, um, whether there's intimidation or, or cultural um, um, pressure. Uh, I'm not sure what it is, but it's very important for those of us who are involved in this, who know that you know, working with, with our men, male colleagues, uh, I, I personally never feel that uh, my, my voice is not as as loud as theirs, or it's not as heard, or it's not as important. And it's really important for us to relay this to other women, uh, and to step up and to uh, to come and bring their work from behind the scenes, because there is a lot of work being done by women. Their participation is equal to the work of men in this revolution, and it's really important for them to come to the front, the forefront, and become part of it publicly. Um, so I think women have uh, a big part of this. Instead of the SNC going out and asking for women to come out, is the women to go out and speak to other women and have them um, participate. Uh, I just want to give you Dima, is there, just, is there a women's caucus within the SNC? Right now, um, we haven't reached that point, and you know, this is a two-week-old SNC, uh, you know, group. So uh, there are efforts. I know a lot of women um, have this idea of wanting to uh, organize the women's movement and um, work. So I'm sure there's there's some of that in the future of the SNC. As of now, you know, we're we're just members, just like everybody else. So, um, but that's definitely something to think about. Just want to um, mention that back in 2007, when Damascus Electoration National Council was formed, um, it selected the chairperson as a, a, was a woman, uh, Dr. Fida Horani, the first Arab opposition ever to have a chair as woman. Also now in the SNC, when we originally launched in, in, uh, in September, the spokesperson of the SNC was also a woman. Dr. Basma Kadmani. So Syria uh, gave women rights to vote before Sweden, by the way. So that's uh, we, true. 19, yeah. 1949. Yes, before uh, women, universal before Sweden. suffrage in Syria, prior to Switzerland as well. Yeah. So uh, we have a, a history and culture that hopefully we can capital, you know, capitalize on. We we introduced earlier in the discussion the question of militarization, and there were a number of 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 um, questions from our audience on different aspects of this of this problem. 
Uh, let me cluster three of them and invite your responses. Two directed to uh, Professor Jojati and Mr. Osama Munajid. First, how could the role of the international community change if the revolution becomes militarized on both sides? Second, uh, do you believe that international military intervention might successfully prevent civil war in Syria, which Murhaf was something that you alluded to as a possibility? And then finally, protecting protesters, and this is a question from a colleague uh, at, at the Department of State, Protest, uh, protecting protesters is a huge, is a high priority for the SNC. What is the role of the Free Syrian Army in this? Could there be a role if it were to clearly espouse uh, a view that it would take a more purely defensive role in protecting uh, protesters? I'll just start with the FSA question on the protesters. The uh, number of defected soldiers so far as declared by the head of the FSA, uh, uh, Colonel uh, Al-Assad, is um, about 15,000 now, and, and counting. Uh, there are talks and, um, uh, and um, connection, obviously, with the FSA and the leadership with the SNC. There's still debate whether to have a formal seat for the FSA in the SNC or not. That's still yet position to be um, discussed and uh, formalized. But the key role that FSA play now is not to launch um, assaults on Assad thugs and mercenaries, but rather to protect civilians, defend neighborhoods. Unfortunately, within this mayhem that's taking place now in the country, um, every few security officers, they form their own uh, mercenaries and thugs. They go house to house, door to door searches and arrests. Not only that, to get the prize and money, although they don't have any uh, names to, to, to arrest, but just to arrest to get the bribe to release those people. And also they take everything. They clear the house from microwave, fridge, TV sets, everything, uh, including jewelry. So uh, it's becoming, and, and whoever opposes these, they, they get shot in the head and they tell, oh, they, their son was demonstrating and their father was helping demonstrators and so on. So what the FSA is doing, at least for the time being, is protecting neighborhoods. They have, it's through various levels and they have the snipers on top, at least if, if these uh, thugs and mercenaries came and they, with the intention of launching assault to wipe everyone in this neighborhood, they would just stop that. And also allow defending as much as they can, as we've seen in Rastan, for several days, three days, um, defend the, the city until they are free and they secure certain passages for civilians to evacuate and leave to certain neighboring villages and, and, and make sure that they, then they withdraw and that was exactly what happened in Rastan, for instance. So that's the, the key role of FSA. Whether, and we still, I mean, this is the key issue. Having more FSA activities of defending civilians and protecting them does by no uh, 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 mean, has absolutely no connection to militarizing the up uprising or civilians carrying weapons. The FSA has been releasing videos and statements that we are going to take this responsibility of defending certain neighborhoods. Do, you do not have to carry weapons. And to confirm, demonstrators always have these banners and chanting that FSA is our defenders and we're not going to, this is a peaceful revolution. So this is the distinction that we, we want to keep. Yeah, if, if I may add to that also, um, uh, working with some of the activists on the ground, um, I know especially in the, in the city of Homs, which has been one of the hardest hit cities, um, the FSA has pretty strong presence there. Um, it's because it's in, in central Syria and um, um, a lot of the affecting soldiers are originally from the area. A lot of the activists have emphasized the importance of the FSA in protecting them from um, the, the, the government, the state security and from the Assad uh, hired thugs. Um, and they all have confirmed that has it not been for the FSA, the number of um, people who have been killed in, especially around Hamas, and I'm focusing on that because that's where the people that I work with, um, the number would be almost double. And what they do is, obviously it's very hard for them to be everywhere, but when, when the demonstrators go out, uh, they are prepared, like Osama um, hinted to, or as he stated, they're, they're prepared to, once um, security or thugs start 
um, aiming uh, firearms at, uh, and weapons at the demonstrators, the free um, Syrian army steps up and defends them. So it becomes more of a self-defense, but it's carried out by the FSA. Um, the other point that I want to make is that the FSA is, uh, has stressed from the beginning that their purpose is, and the, w the reason they do all of this is to ensure that these demonstrations, that the whole movement, that the revolution remains a peaceful one. And I think that's one of the most important things that we've seen in, in the Syrian revolution, that for seven months, it still remains a peaceful one, unarmed civilians going out and facing bullets, and the FSA wants to ensure that continues. And the last point I want to make is that from the first moment that the FSA started forming and coming out, they received requests from some people wanting to volunteer to join it, and they actually turned them down because they don't want to be known for arming the civilians. Again, it's, it's in the spirit of keeping this a peaceful movement. The, these are some very important qualifications in understanding how militarization is becoming organized within Syria, and I think goes some way toward giving us a more informed sense of some of the different trends and dynamics. Some of those are difficult to see from the outside. And I, I don't doubt that this question of militarization and armed resistance will continue to be a significant concern among uh, international actors thinking about the kind of role they might play in Syria in the future. And, and, and I suspect that if we were to see the escalation of armed resistance, it would at some point have to be taken into account in the calculus of international actors thinking about what role they might, they might play. Time is getting short. We have a large number of additional questions. Let me try and get through at least two sets of questions that came in that I think do draw us to some important issues. The, the, the Syrian uprising as it has um, uh, unfolded, uh, it, given the challenges that the, the opposition has confronted in reaching a critical tipping point in its efforts to overthrow the regime, seem to me to have provoked several main lines of response. One is militarization. Another has been to spur the opposition to accelerate and amplify its own efforts to become organized and develop the kind of coherent structures that would establish its viability as an alternative. But the third, and this is the focus of the questions, has been to revive discussions about the feasibility of a negotiated settlement with the Assad regime. And we have two questions along that line. First is, does the Syrian opposition, especially the SNC, is the Syrian opposition, especially the SNC, prepared in any way to negotiate with the regime and or enter into a power sharing arrangement with the regime, i.e. a negotiated power sharing arrangement. We have seen some proposals offered in this regard by the Arab League, in particular one of them. Uh, there were others. The second question is, what is the assessment of the SNC about the capacity of the Assad regime to negotiate? We have heard all kinds of claims about internal divisions within the regime, about hardliners and softliners, about the possibility that Bashar himself and others may in fact be open to the prospect for a negotiated settlement, but have been overruled or marginalized by hardliners. What is the SNC's assessment of the potential for this regime to enter negotiations? Two, two sides of the same kind of question. Can I start then? I think it's worth all of us commenting on that. Uh, we um, clearly don't have a, an official position I mean, of SNC on this, but I think we do embrace um, the uh, revolutionaries' uh, position on um, uh, basically rejecting to negotiate with those who have been responsible for killing 
um, civilian protesters. I think this is a clear uh, position by now of SNC and all Syrian opposition, and, and in fact, most Syrians. Um, up till really very recently, as I said, I mean, you know, prior to the revolution in the first week or two, we were still appealing to Bashar al-Assad to uh, take a leading role in the transition uh, of Syria and kind of more gradual transition into democracy. And uh, um, Bashar has proven over and over and over that he's not uh, capable nor maybe willing nor uh, to do so. Um, I, I, I wrote a book back in 2006 um, about uh, documenting the lost opportunities that, uh, of the regime and the subtitle of it, Bashar of Lost Opportunities. And that was my assessment back in 2006. And uh, I think he has not proven me wrong, thanks, you know, to, to uh, at least academically, that's good for me. But uh, the point is that he really has not shown leadership um, uh, at any level. And he sided with the, uh, the forces, his brother, that's really responsible for, for the killing. He has not shown any uh, distance from those forces, which makes it, um, you know, extremely difficult, uh, almost impossible for us to uh, negotiate with, with him. H however, we do um, extend, um, you know, the idea of negotiation to anyone in the regime that has not been uh, responsible for the killing of Syrians. In fact, we count we consider that possibility as one of the uh, good scenarios for uh, making that transition, including members of the uh, army, uh, those professional uh, generals. This is why we do encourage defection at the highest level. We do know that uh, for the, in order for that to happen, we need certain conditions that be present. Uh, and this is li likely to happen at an advanced phase. Um, uh, some of them is to isolate the regime diplomatically, maybe create some um, safe haven somewhere um, at one point, uh, um, continue to send assuring messages and willingness um, that, that they are part, in fact, of um, the future of Syria. So um, the, the principle of negotiations should not be ruled out uh, at all, but clearly not with those responsible for the killing of peaceful protesters. And at this point, we believe Bashar, Maher al-Assad are uh, directly responsible for that. So um, other than you know, few individuals, and we're trying to make this as narrow as possible, and you know, the head of the security apparatus are clearly uh, included in that circle. Other than that, I think we extend um, you know, uh, the idea of negotiations to any Syrian that uh, they have the right to be part of the future of Syria. I think that's you know, the starting point. You want to? Thank you. No, actually, I'm going to um, ask that we move to, okay, to one second. last question. Um, and this concerns the relationship of different groupings within Syria to the SNC and their participation in the uprising, two important, very different, but important uh, communities. What is the relationship of the uh, SNC and the local coordinating committees in Syria is one question. And the other is, how involved is the Kurdish community in the uprising? Is the Kurdish community itself, which represents about a third of Syria's population, something uh, around that uh, number. Um, no, actually, not, 10%. 10%? 10%? Yeah. 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 The Kurdish? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the Forget others that. have migrated. 10%. <laughs> um, uh, does the Kurdish community, it's, is the Kurdish community itself united, or are there factions that are for and against the uprising and uh, a quick answer to this one, if you if you can. Just a quick one on the on the Kurds. Uh, it is a big myth that the Kurds have not been demonstrating uh, since the beginning. The Kurds have been demonstrating since March 18, and we have tens of videos every day and big large numbers every Friday. But that being said, they still think that they paid a heavy price in 2004, where many of them were uh, hanged in front of their houses. And the rest of the country did not really pay much attention. That's number one. Number two is that their political leaders still wanted to have some kind of negotiated position with the rest of the political um, 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 you know, figures or leaders or opposition before they mobilize in big numbers. And 
when an, an, an indirect reason of the assassination of one of their key leaders, Michel Temo, is that he became part of the SNC executive committee and he had several conference, you know, Skype uh, live conferences with them and he met with different other figures inside Damascus, including Riyadh Saif, on discussing the details. And they, uh, that's why when the regime realized that the Kurds will go and mobilize in huge numbers. And yes, when they assassinated him, now we've seen hundreds of thousands in the street, not only in, in the Kurdish areas in Syria, but now there is a huge sympathy with the, Kurdish, uh, with the Kurdistan Iraq. Now, uh, um, not only moral political support, but also financial and also uh, many of the families on both sides. So uh, there's a huge uh, shift in the Kurdish map and all the region towards supporting the SNC and being part of the revolution now. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and then for the, uh, the question about the local coordinating committees, I think that was one of the big steps of uh, leading up to the um, October 2nd uh, meeting in Istanbul, uh, announcing the additional seat additional members of the SNC, and that was a huge step of the LCC joining um, and uh, joining the SNC. And as of now, uh, there's a large number of seats dedicated to the grassroots movements, including the LCC um, inside, in, in Syria. Thank you, thank you. You were at minorities collectively about a third. Right, right. yes. Thank you, right. okay. Yes. Um, I was not able to pose all of your questions to our speakers. I have to say that if I were to think myself about the range of questions that it would be important to ask them, you did a fabulous job in raising them yourselves. And so thank you all very much for your participation. And I think what we have seen today in our comments from our Syrian colleagues is precisely why the Syrian government takes the formation of the SNC so seriously. They, they pose a formidable challenge, I think, to the Assad regime. And I would like to make sure that we all uh, thank them for their participation today, today and wish them uh, uh, good luck and best wishes in the success of your work in the future. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.